Revelation chapter 3. I want you to look at verse number 1. Revelation 1, 3, the Bible reads, And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest, and art dead. It's interesting that this church is dead. He's trying to tell them, you're dead, and you have a name as if you're alive, and yet you are dead. There are walls, a roof, a steeple, a parking lot, a sign by the road. Hey, there's even people on the inside. There's rooms and buildings. And yet, he says, it's dead. It's dead. I want to bring this to your attention because God warns these. He has different messages to these churches in the beginning of the book of Revelation. And he doesn't want a church to die. That is not God's will. There are churches all across Jacksonville. They're dead. There are some big name churches that died a long time ago and it's just a country club. They're no longer preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They can fill a parking lot and they, boy, they can fill a bank account and they'll slap you on the back and say, good to see you, brother. But they're dead. And I bring this up, I, I want to make sure that this church doesn't die. God's will is that this church would be alive. That it would stay alive. That it would get on fire. And that God could use it for years to come. I want to talk tonight about how to put life back into a dead church. Life. I want to give you my plan, my vision that the Lord's given me for what we need to do, what we need to focus on. Now, I'm a, I'm a, a big picture kind of guy, and um, I like to know all the little nitty-gritty details. I am a nerd. I want to know. I, I, sometimes I just can't rest until I've solved the problem in my mind. But I've got to know this, and I've got to have that, and I've got to figure this, and I've got to know that. I want to know from A to Z before we go. Sometimes God wants us to walk by faith. I think it's wise to be a good steward and make sure that uh, you count the cost, whether you have sufficient enough to continue the building, right? We don't want to start building and then find out, oh, we ran out of building supplies. The, the plan I'm going to give you tonight is simple, but in my mind, in my heart, what the Lord's providing, I think it's much more complex. And there's some details that the Lord wants to work out, and we're going to put that on Him. But let me give you my vision tonight, how to put life back into a dead church. And in a sense, this is my plan, my master plan on how to marry Law of Liberty Baptist Church that's been around for six days as of today, and Temple Baptist Church that at one point was... Uh, Halsema Baptist and North Halsema and it's been around for 50 years. It started up here down by a river in a little old church house that used to flood. And uh, what's interesting is we have an interesting past and y'all have some interesting history. And together, I think we have a future. And I want to show you my plan how to keep this church from dying, how to put life back into a dead church. Look at the next verse, verse 2. He says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. You know, we need maintenance in our life. We need maintenance in our life, don't we? There are some machines in these buildings that need maintenance, and there's some things, some walls that need painted, and things to be changed and fixed and updated and all like that. Uh, you know, I mean, this is just life. I, I was joking with the men a little while ago on our van. There's a light. That, and I said, guys, I, I was staring in the, the, the dashboard of my van, and I got a great idea for a sermon title. They said, what was it? Maintenance required. You know, <laughs> you know, sometimes in the Christian life we find ourselves where I just need a checkup. I need a good spiritual checkup to see where I'm standing, where I'm going. Remember what I've been told I need to do. Reevaluate what gifts God's given me so I know how to minister to other people. We need, there's some maintenance required. There's a spiritual checkup to see if we're actually growing unto the measure, the fullness of the stature of Christ. That we're actually growing up as Christians and growing out as we learn the Word and we minister to others. He says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Take care of business. we got to take care and strengthen some of the things around here. And he's not just talking about the walls. He's talking about y'all. He's talking about the people. I think it's important to have a church that encourages one another 
and lifts each other up and motivates and says, how you doing? How you been? Good to see you. And I don't just mean at a shallow level. I mean really caring. A few months ago, I preached a sermon. Oh, this is longer than that. Maybe a year. I don't know. But uh, I made the point that we ought to pray for every family in our church by name. And we started to have it in our, in our house where we would pick a family for the week. And whether it was breakfast or dinner or our nighttime devotions, we said, we're going to pray for this family. And even some of the little kids, you don't always know what to pray for, but when you got little kids praying for little kids, I think the Lord is happy, you know. Uh, and, and, and we were talking about this at church one time, and Sister Emma, wherever she went to hide, she said, Oh, I do it differently. I do it by that. I've got a family per day of the week. And she started, she had a little pattern worked out where I pray for this family on this day and this family on that day. And it was like, whoa, I'm impressed. That's pretty good. What a good habit to encourage, not just saying, how you doing? Good to see you. But to pray for the folks in your church. Pray for one another. Encourage one another. Lift each other up. Strengthen the things which remain, he says, that are ready to die. Listen, there are th some things that are ready to die. And I, I, I say this to warn you, not to scare you, but you have to know your own flesh, your human nature. You know, it doesn't take much to set somebody off course and they say, ah, I've had it, I'm not going back to church. I've seen it my whole life. Raised in church. My brother was named after a famous actor. Then my parents got saved. Then my brother got saved and he preached the gospel to me. I got saved. When I, my, they had gotten saved and named me after Adam in the Bible. I said, oh, he's the one that messed it all up, you know. Uh, but I claimed the last Adam. He fixed it all. So I claimed the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 calls him the last Adam. Uh, there are some things that are ready to die. He says, for I have not found thy works perfect before the Lord. We need to strengthen the good things. We need to encourage the good things. We need to motivate those in a good thing. If we'll do this, then we can begin uh, to sustain the life of a church. He says in verse 3, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. And he said, there's some things you need to change your mind about, and you've got to change what's going on. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. There in Revelation 3, 3, what he's talking about, I'm going to show up and I'm going to shut you down is what God is saying. I'm going to come like a thief. You're not expecting it. Whoa, it just came out of the blue. Elsewhere he talks about, I'm going to remove your candlestick. The candle representing the church. And he's like, you're not living up to your name. I'm going to take you away and destroy you. And, and God can do another work somewhere else. And he has and he will. But his will is, rather than die, that we would strengthen the things that remain. That we would keep it alive and get that zeal for the Lord, rather than seeing the church removed. Look at verse 4. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He's, he's talking about those that are saved, and they're still serving God. He says they're worthy. There's a few names. There's a few people. Boy, they're still fighting the fight. Man, they, I, you know, I, I'm impressed in this church. We got some folks that have been here for over, I mean, for 50 years and others for 30 years. And maybe you say, well, I've only been here 10 or 12 years. Hey, amen. Praise the Lord. If you've only been here for one year, I want to encourage you. One year is a long time and make it to two. Keep going. Keep living for the Lord. Look at verse 5. He says, he that overcometh. Now, now I have to preface this. Uh, if you don't know what overcoming is, it tells us in 1 John 5, 5, it says, who is he that overcometh? the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. How do we overcome this present world and get out of this world into heaven? Well, we have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So when you look at verse 5, if you would, Revelation 3, verse 5, he that overcometh, that means they're saved, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, that's God's righteousness, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before the angels. That's called eternal security. When your name is in the book of life, he will not blot you out. Once you're saved, you're always saved. That's God's promise. And he can't lie. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Amen. Now look at verse 6. He says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, do you want to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches? Uh, do, you, do you want to hear what the Word of God says about keeping a church alive and awake and uh, fired up so that it doesn't die? 
my first point up here. I've got a, I've got a helper tonight because I'm still trying to work out the logistics and uh, trust me, her handwriting is legible, okay? <laughs> we'll leave it at that, okay. Uh, my first point, how do we make sure we have a name that's not defiled? How as a church, as a congregation, can we make sure that we're doing the right thing so that we have God's blessing? Well, I'll tell you, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. The number one thing we need to do is preach Christ and Him crucified. The absolute number one thing that we have to focus on in this church is the Lord Jesus Christ. That He has the preeminence. He is above all. It's not just about the group. It's not about the events and the activities. And all that's great. That's encouraging. But let's not lose our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there are things that we could all, there are more things in the Bible we could all learn about Jesus that we don't know yet. Or maybe we heard it years ago and we haven't strengthened it in those memories. What do you say in Hebrews 2 the, that we've let it slip? Well, let's strengthen these things. The Lord Jesus Christ, put Him first, preach Him most. And I have to remind you, we can't do anything without Him. We can't keep a church open by my power or your power or my bank or your bank or my friends or your friends if God wants to take away the candlestick he will and we're praying he won't and we're asking him for help and we're asking believing receiving with a great desire that God would do a mighty work here he says look at verse 7 and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He that is true. He that hath the key of David. He that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. It's interesting as he's um, speaking, as the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking. This is red letter if you have a red letter Bible. He's holy. He's true. Uh, but he has the key of David. Do you know that he has fulfilled Many of those promises that were given to David about his kingship. And yet, there's prophecies yet to come. Oh, he's coming back as a king. He came as a servant to begin with. But the promises of David, so many of them, were fulfilled with the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 8. He says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. And no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word. And has not denied my name. If we'll focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, preaching Him and Him crucified, teaching Him in a greater and a mightier way, learning to rely on Him more and more, glorifying Him for everything that He allows us to do, then I believe we're on a good foundation. We're, we're, we're shoring up that foundation. I always use the illustration. For instance, uh, if you told me, well, the, the, the roof is leaking up here. And it comes down and there's a crack down the wall and the window's broken and there's a crack in the floor. Oh, it's a foundation problem. The, the foundation has shifted. Do we call the roofers first? No. We, we fix the foundation. The foundation of this church is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to get back to that and strengthen that else we die. He says, you have a little strength. Look at it in verse 8. You have an open door. No man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength. And it's good to recognize, Lord, I've only got a little strength and we're putting it all on you. And has kept my word and has not denied my name. If you would, go to John 15, please. Go to John 15. Remember, Jesus, He is our strength. Jesus, is the, He is our word, right? He is the living word of God. And the thought here is, have we kept God at the center of our focus? Is He uh, the, the foundation of all of our truth? Or, or is it man's doctrine? Well, I went to this school and they taught that and that's why I believe this. That's why I have such a problem with Calvinism and Arminianism. And they're both wrong. They're both false gospels. And that's man's doctrine. Man concocted something up and they wrote some big book and they say, well, I'm over here and you're over there. And I say, you know what? I'm right here and I don't see any of it. This is the foundation of truth. This is the foundation of our salvation. It's not man's doctrine. It's not some TV show. You know how many times since I've been in the ministry I've had people try to tell me, oh, but I saw ancient aliens from the History Channel. And I just stop them right there. Wait, 
history channel is talking about aliens isn't that an oxymoron in and of itself you know i think there were aliens but i think they're really fallen angels they're devils so it's not like little green men it's they're devils trying to deceive people john 15 look at this this is an awesome passage look at john 15 verse number one i am the true vine and my father is the husbandman every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away now think about the church aspect you walk up to a tree and you're wanting some fruit well this branch is dead throw it away here's his warning and every branch that beareth fruit well praise the lord that's us that's y'all right we're bearing some fruit here and we've got some fruit over here what's he say he purgeth it oh now that hurts you know purging a tree uh, we, we have one in our front yard, a citrus tree, and we start breaking off branches and moving things around, and then it grew in a new way and in a better way. You know, sometimes God has to, listen to this, purge a church so it can bear more fruit. If we had every person that's been through our church in six years show up in one day, we wouldn't all fit in here and in there and over there. We wouldn't fit here. And I'm sure it's the same with y'all. It'd be like if we had everybody since the beginning, I mean, how many ever acres wouldn't be enough? Because we've had so many people come and go and come and go. And it breaks our hearts sometimes. It's like, oh, they'd be perfect for our church. And, but sometimes God wants to purge a church. And that hurts. We should love people and hate to see them go. But look at his point. He says, every branch, verse 2, that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. So you start off with fruit, and now you've got more fruit. And this is God's will for you as a Christian, personally and congregationally. He wants more fruit. Verse 3, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. We're clean through the word. We purge ourselves and clean ourselves by getting in the word. Verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Do you understand what that means? You cannot break a branch off and stick it in the dirt or float it in the air or nail it to a wall and it's just going to start growing uh, grapes or you know, oranges. It just doesn't work that way. And we live in a time where everybody says, oh, oh, I do church. I, I watch online. You do? Really? How often do you do that? And I, you know, COVID is the universal excuse, isn't it? Well, since COVID, you know, we started watching online. Okay, are you fellowshipping? Because that's part of church. Are you singing and praising God as a group? Because that's part of church. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abide in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. There we, so we go from fruit to more fruit to much fruit. And look what he says at the end of five. For without me, ye can do nothing. This list of putting life in a dead church, it has to start with the Lord Jesus Christ. Without him, we can do nothing. I tell you, I know we've been on our knees, we've been praying, we've been praying as a, as a church for years now that the Lord would miraculously provide in a supernatural way so that it could only be said, that was the Lord. And I think God loves it when we do things like that. We're like, Lord, show me the impossible. Lord, give me that mountain. I don't even have a shovel, but can you move a mountain? I think that's when God gets the glory. He says, without me, ye can do Nothing. Right. Everything we do, we ought to give God the glory. The number one priority here needs, how do you revive a dead church? Preach Jesus. Obey His Word. Make Him the priority. Look at verse 7. It says, If ye abide in Me, and My words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. He says, If you obey Me and you put your words in My heart, guess what? I'll do whatever you need. I'll take care of business for you. If you would, go to Acts chapter 6. I'm asking God to do a great work here in this 
Pulsema area. I am. I'm asking for uh, the glory of the name of the Lord to be known. I want people to hear that God can still revive churches. It don't, we don't have to go liberal. We don't have to throw out our, our, our separation from the world. We don't have to bring in rock and roll music. We don't have to rent it out to the Pentecostals or the Seventh-day Adventists. I want the world to know. I want Halsema to know. I want Jacksonville to know that God still has the power to keep a candlestick burning, to keep a church alive. I want people to see that perhaps there's a new united work under the banner of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we'll put Him first and do it for His glory and not our own, He can do it. I think he would like us to be part of it. My next point. Here in Acts 6, my next point is that we are independent. We are independent Baptists, more specifically. Now, I know, I know we're Christian first. Amen. But we're not going to take Baptist off the sign because there are Baptist distinctives that are very important. Yep. We stand on the Word of God. We're King James only. We're soul winning. We believe in the separation from the world. There are many practices and standards and we are independent Baptist. That means we are not part of the Southern Baptist Association. That means we are not part of, uh, of a larger area. There's no strings in this church to any big name preachers. It ought not to be that some big name preacher can come in and say, Well, brother, you still got this red carpet? Don't you know we all switched to blue last year? You better get busy. It ought not to be that outside influences can interfere with the families inside of the church. And this is very close to my heart because I've grown up in Baptist churches the majority of my life. And I've seen too many times where it's a good old boy system. They say they're independent. But they start rubbing elbows with brother so-and-so, preacher so-and-so down the road. And they'll, they'll call you, oh, you got so-and-so in your church now, huh? Well, you know, uh, old brother so-and-so told me this about him. If I were you, I wouldn't let him serve as a deacon. I wouldn't let him pick up the offering. I wouldn't let him pass out bulletins. And they start talking about people and tearing people down. Being an independent church means we're 100% solely dependent on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not part of a pope or a denomination or some fair weather fellowship. Yeah, we like you for now. Ooh, we changed our mind about you. Uh, hey, maybe we'll let you back in. That's not how it goes. We're separate. We're distinct. We're alone, but you know what? Together, God builds the church on the inside. We depend on each other to take care of each other. Sometimes, and I've seen it, where outside influences will help you make a decision but when you need help and you need somebody to come see you in the hospital, you need somebody to give you a ride, you can't call them. They don't care. But the people in your church that love you, know your name, know what's going on in the week, that's our family. Church is a picture of a family. It's made up of families and individuals, and it's one big family locally. We're gathered together for the glory of God. It's important because scriptural authority is under Christ, a Baptist distinctive. We believe everything it says and we're going to do what it says. And I, as the preacher, I stand under this. And if I say something that's wrong according to this, you come and tell me. And you say, well, wait a minute, Brother Fannin, you forgot about this verse. Oh my, you're right. God's right. I was wrong. That's really the way it ought to be. It's gotten to the point where preachers are, it's, it's all about them and their show and and listen, I'm, I pray every day, oh, Lord, I need your help. I need your humility. I need wisdom because uh, I don't want to be lifted up, but I want to magnify his word. Amen. And I need, a, I need to be accountable to a congregation to do that. And the congregation needs to be accountable to a preacher that will preach the whole counsel of God. And he's going to touch on your sin. Whether or not he knows it's yours, he's going to come across it as we preach everything. Ooh, he finally got me. I thought he didn't know. You know, no, that's the Lord working. That's the way it ought to work. That's God's will. In Acts chapter 6, I want you to see this, because you know we, we as a church, it's for the people under Christ. That's the pattern. Acts chapter 6, look at verse number 3. 
Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report. So here this gathering, an apostle comes in. Now imagine it. Hey, men, look ye, which by the way, King James Bible, ye, versus the, ye is plural. He's saying y'all. Y'all know what that means. We're in the South. He's saying ye all. He's saying all you, Look inside of you, and you find some men that meet these requirements. And here's what I expect. Look what he says, verse 3. Honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Now, the church business is business, and I know the critics say, oh, they ran that church like it's a business, and it ought not to be ran like a for-profit business, like they're selling hot dogs down the road, and they're buying houses and renting them to people. That's weird. Like, like not like that, but there is business that needs to be taken care of. And if nobody's taking care of the business, then there's a problem, and we can't meet. Early church, boy, they would go to somebody's house. He was rich. He had a big old house, and he had a business to provide the house. But the church business inside was among the people. And so he says, look inside of you and find some men. Verse 4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. He says, we're doing our work. You guys need to find some men to do work inside. Verse 5, and the saying pleased the whole multitude. That's another name for church, the whole group. The assembly, the congregation. All the people said, yeah, that makes sense. We'll look inside of ourselves. We all know each other. Well, I know he's full of the Holy Ghost. I've heard him preach. You know, he's got a good reputation. And we start looking and finding people and putting them together. And we come up with a list. And it's like of all the, we got 20. Now we're down to 10. And now we got, we got the seven, right? So look what he says. And verse five, and the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they, that's the multitude, chose Stephen. A man full of faith in the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, and whom they, that's the church, set before the apostles. They brought him and said, here's our seven men, we found them. And when they, that's the church, had prayed, they laid their hands on them. You know what's unique about independent Baptists, historically, we believe that the authority is in the church. And we believe that we look inside and we should raise up men. We should be training men now to take the role of the preacher. We should. That's our, that's our job. This is important. Every, you know, and if we go back and look at our history in America, it was the Church of England persecuting Christians. You don't have the freedom. You have to be like us. And then we're free. And then it was Presbyterians making Baptists buy a license from them for permission to preach. And it's like, well, you Presbyterians preach a false gospel, and the Baptists were persecuted in America. If you know your history, we're independent Baptists. I don't get a license from the state. I don't get a permit to speak from the king. We don't get it from the pope. We don't get it from a cardinal. No, sir. We get it from the people that have the Holy Spirit. Notice that. They prayed. They laid their hands on them. Verse 7. Because they did it, it says, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. He said, Pick seven men that can get out there and preach and take care of business. And now that it's like, hey, I'm going to pick you to go preach the gospel all day. Don't worry about working in the field anymore. We'll pay your bills. You preach the gospel. Wow, that's a dream job. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll go in the synagogue and then I'll go over here and I'll go over there. And boy, I'm just going to go everywhere and preach the gospel. I want that as a full-time job. And then what happened? Well, look what he says in verse 7. The word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied. Not just addition, but multiplication. God has a plan. We need to stay independent. We need to recognize the authorities in here. We need to trust the Lord, give it to God, do it His way. And then just pray and say, God, would you multiply our work? Would you fill this place up to where we have to start talking about building another one over here? Go to Deuteronomy 6 for my next point. Deuteronomy chapter 6. So 
the foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. The method is independence, independent Baptist. One of our missions that is super important that we've kind of forgotten about is family building. I mentioned it on Wednesday night, if you're here on Wednesday night, uh, that the average family 100 years ago had eight children. And now it's like 2.3, right? It's not just building in numbers. God's plan has always been that we build our families for the Lord. Listen to me, mom and dad. Those souls that you have, you're responsible for them. You answer for your soul, for their soul. You answer for how you lead them, what you teach them, the hypocrisy you're guilty of in front of them. You answer for that soul. And America says, put them on a bus, send them off to strangers, we'll teach them communism and homosexuality. You stay at home and watch TV, or you go into the workplace. Mom's free to go to work so she can answer to some strange man and bring him coffee. The children come home by the end of the night. You don't know what they've learned. They've got new friends and new phrases and a different heart than you. They have different politics than you, different standards of morality. And sometimes they come back with a different God. And then you hope to win their heart. You throw them a TV dinner. <laughs> Microwave your own. It's in the fridge. <laughs> we don't even eat together anymore. We're separate. You go to a restaurant. Everybody's bowing down to their cell phone looking at that. And their parents are across and their children are here. And they all have their own little device. And it's like they're praying to that. And they don't care about their family. You know what builds a church righteously? Family building. This has been God's plan all along. You send your children off to strangers, and guess what? They come back as strangers. If I could account to you the number of men that have said, well, I sent my kids off to school, or I sent them off to college, and they came back, and they're commies. Like, I'm voting for, you know, keep the guns and eliminate abortion, and they're talking about all this weird stuff. Where'd they learn it? And it's like, who's, you think you can send them off all day and hope to get them back for an hour and win their heart back? Hope to undo the damage that Satan and society has done? It doesn't work that way. One of the Baptist distinctives is that we take care of our own. We take care of our own family. The Bible teaches we should take care of our elderly. We should take care of people inside of the church. These are biblical Christian concepts. I, I do have a, a Sunday school plan. It's not as Sunday school has always been. I want Sunday school to be safe and accountable. Uh, and we have to do it in an orderly fashion, one thing at a time. I have a plan. It's going to take some time. I want it to work right. I want to make sure these children are safe. I want to make sure it could never be said like just about every other church in town. Did you hear what happened? Somebody messed with some kid. I don't want that reputation for this church. We'll work harder. We'll keep them closer. We'll put up cameras and we'll take doors off. We'll come together. We will. A Baptist distinctive has always been to train up our own children to be Christians, to be Baptists. John the Baptist, the prophecy of him coming. Malachi 4, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. It's a curse when the father and the son are separated. It's a curse when mom doesn't know what her daughter believes or knows what's going on in her life. If I, and again, I could count time after time. No, my kids are pretty good. I, I know you think keep them close, but we're doing just fine. Oh, they were caught doing drugs. And oh, no, now they're sleeping. It happens. It just keeps happening. It keeps happening. I'm trying to warn people. The methods aren't working. We've got to do something different. It's insanity to keep doing something. We're losing our children. Where do they go? I don't know. They left. They'll never come back. This is happening in many churches. You're in Deuteronomy 6. Look at this pattern in verse 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, 
and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. And thou, now, now again, we're King James people. Ye is y'all. But now he's talking to one. Thou. That's you individually. He's talking to you as an individual with a family. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. So God's given you a great commandment. He says you better love God. I'm going to give you the commandments so you know how to live. And you, dad, you, mom, better teach them to your children. He says thou shalt teach them diligently. That means not lazily, not halfway. And look, I know homeschooling can be difficult, but children learn all the time. They learn all throughout the day. They learn from your personality. They learn your morality. They learn your characteristics. And it's funny, Naomi Ruth, she's, she's so smart. That girl will read anything you put in front of her. I mean, she's just soaking it up like a sponge. And we're talking about, in Proverbs, about the adulterous woman. We're talking about a witch. And we're looking at Bible things. I'm explaining this to her. And she's like, what's a witch? She doesn't understand because she hasn't seen it in TV or the or, you know, uh, uh, Halloween and all that. And I said, well, it's a woman that hates God and they usually dress in black and they're out to live for Satan and they do bad stuff. And she, can I see the gears turning? Okay, she didn't say anything, right? Three months later, we're standing in Costco and she says, Dad, is that a witch? And there was a woman dressed inappropriately in all black. And I'm like, well, um, okay, so let me, let me back that. Let's, let's redefine this a little better. Right? Children learn. Children are such sponges. They say, baby, we were talking about this in between services. They say babies don't know. My wife has a uh, pink uh, cover that she uses when she's nursing the baby. And one of the other moms borrowed it. And my one-year-old starts going... <laughs> Like, I, I didn't know the milk buffet was open. You know what I mean? She's like, wait a minute, that's mine. And I know what that means. And children know. They pay attention. They know what's going on. And you know what he says? Thou shalt teach them. I really believe if we'd get back to the biblical worldview of things, we would see dad working twice as hard as he had to taking on two jobs if he had to, praying to God for promotion so mom didn't have to go to the world so the babies didn't have to go to the world. The public school system is broken. We all know it. Sure. And the only way to fix it is to not participate. While homeschooling is still legal, I encourage you to homeschool. Look what he says, Deuteronomy 6, 7. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in the house we call that the TV hour, typically, when you're sitting in your house at night, okay? <laughs> Not in the Bible. All right, all right. He says, that when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, that's in the daytime, and when thou liest down, that's bedtime, and when thou risest up, that's the morning, that's breakfast time. So when do I teach my children the Bible? Oh, I don't know. When you wake up, when you go through your day, when you sit down in your house, and when you go to bed. I think he's pretty well saying all the time. They're always listening. They're always learning. Amen. Yeah. And my opinion on Sunday school as it is today with so many dangers in the world and you don't know what's happened to the children or where they're at or what filth has been pumped into their mind from the television and you bring them in and you put them with children that are protected and separated from a godly standard and then uh, filthiness comes out of their mouth. Now you've got a whole other problem. Instead of, rather than asking strangers to send their kids to our church so we can teach them the Bible, let me recommend that you get the parents to bring their children with them and we'll have a Sunday school lesson. We'll teach that family how to teach their family the Bible. Let me teach you. Now, here's an old term. Who knows what I'm talking about? Family altar. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. The family altar. It's family Bible time. It, there, it breaks my heart when in our family we're too busy we can't. It happens every now and then. I wish I could say, we never miss family altar. I wish I could say that. If we, I want our whole day to revolve around, we need to open the Bible. We need to pray for our friends. We need to talk about what it means. We need to pray for each other's needs. We need to know that there's a God that hears. We need to come to Him. We need to learn of Him. 
if we can help teach other families how to teach their children the Bible, to me that makes the most biblical sense. Instead of, hey strangers, send me your kids. We promise we won't hurt them. Oh, I don't care. Take them anyway. I get them out of my hair. The kids don't care. The parents don't care. They're not invested. They're not interested. Give me some candy. You got any Kool-Aid? And look, it's like, hey, look, we'll feed you. We love it. Jesus fed them, you know. But rather than that, in a system that I think is broken at a broken time, let's get the whole family here. And let's have a Sunday school class just for families on how to train our children the Bible. How to start our day in the Bible. How to teach the basic principles of the Bible. What salvation is. What prayer is. What baptism is. So they can take that home and they say, you know, pastor's right. We need to have not Sunday school. We need to have everyday school. We need to have a family altar time every night as a family. If we'll do that, they won't be strangers. We won't lose their souls to the devil. Proverbs 22, 6, Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train him in the right way, and he'll keep going. Uh, go back to Revelation. Go to Revelation 2 for me. We're almost done. Revelation 2. As you're going there, let me read uh, Ephesians 6. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Again, I just bring it home to dad. If you can get dad in church, then dad's going to hear the word and say, yeah, that's good. We need more of that in our life. And then maybe dad will begin a prayer habit. Uh, Brother Luke and Sister Mena, as we were uh, marriage counseling before they got married, one of the things I recommended is every night at the end of the night, you two get down on your knees and you both pray to God together. And you have an open prayer relationship with God. And you confess your faults and you talk about your needs and you bring it to the Lord as a team, as a family. Well, Dad, you have such power in the household. Every company that I've ever seen or worked for that had a problem, we all know it was the boss. It wasn't the manager. Dad, the buck stops with the buck. It's time for you to train your children. My last point is evangelism. We call it soul winning. Winning souls unto the Lord. Uh, you're in Revelation 2. Give me a second. Let me read this to you. In 2 Timothy 4, he says, But watch thou in all things... Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist. What's your job? Work as an evangelist. Evangelize people. Tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that can fix everything. He alone is the solution. But if they don't know, I mean Romans 10, how shall they hear without a preacher? But then it goes on and say, how shall they preach? Unless they're sent. That's the duty of the local church. We're going to send you out to preach the gospel. Revelation 2, look at verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You know what your first love is? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. We love Him because He first loved us, right? Uh, he, he, we, when we got saved, we, we, we gave Him all, right? But now we've kind of changed our priorities. We've fallen back into the world. We've got these idols and distractions. When I fell in love with my wife, do you know how my family knew? I told them. When you fell in love with the Lord Jesus Christ because He purchased your soul with His own blood on that old rugged cross and you figured it out, that's easy to be saved. All I have to do is trust in Him. He's finished the work. Wow! Boy, that is good news! And you get saved and then... How do people know that you converted to Christianity? Come on. Did you put on a new badge? Did you change your Facebook status? See, let me tell you something. I was lost, but now I'm found. See, I thought I had it figured out, but let me tell you the truth. Some of the men we go soul winning with, that's their exact testimony. We're out inviting folks to church and preaching the gospel. You 100% sure? You say, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure, 100%. Well, 95, 75, right? And you start asking them, what do you think you have to do to go to heaven? Oh, I don't know. A lot of stuff, right? Be born again. Okay, how do you get born again? Oh, get saved. Oh, how do you do that? Uh, 
be good, keep the commandments, repent of all your sins, turn it around. It's like, boy, that sounds like hard work. Yeah, that's hard work. And you say, listen, I used to think the same thing until somebody showed me out of the Bible. Can I show you what you have to do to be saved? Amen. Oh, I'd love that. We're going to build a church and keep it from dying with life on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to stay independent, which means dependent on each other and dependent on God. We're going to do it by building families and building families and building families and building individuals. And we're going to do it through evangelism. Look at verse 5. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. You know what the first works are? Preaching the gospel. The first thing you did that you can have an eternal reward for after you got saved was you told somebody else about Jesus. I want you to understand this. Holding a door for a little old lady or giving a contribution or even buying somebody a Bible before you got saved is not a work that you will be rewarded for in heaven. After you get saved, all the works you do for God on earth, He will reward you eternally. And after you got saved, the first work you did was preach the gospel. You opened your mouth. You did some work. It took some energy. You were excited. You said something. You said, man, I was lost, but now I'm found. Even if that's all you said, or you, you call somebody and you say in the world, I found religion. It's all through Jesus. You start to communicate and tell somebody that something's different. That's the first work. It's the first thing you did. He says, do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. And listen, I know that there are some folks in here, maybe you're getting up there in age and you're using a walker and you're like, it's hard for me. I can't go out soul winning like you young bucks, like these teenagers go out knocking all these doors and having a good time. I get that. And sometimes my wife wants to be out there, but she can't. She's helping babies. And the Bible teaches that we are rewarded together for our work. And uh, listen, and you, you support us from the pew and you pray for us and you say, how's it going soul winning? You know what we need in this church? We've got some teenagers that have won their first souls this year and they need the older generation that's been doing it for a long time. They need to say, I heard you're a soul winner, young man. Tell me about it. What's one of your favorite go-to verses? If you could only leave them one verse, which one do you normally use? You encourage them in the Lord and you pray for them that God would turn them into a mighty preacher. We're going to go soul winning. We're going to do it together. Proverbs eleven thirty: 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that winneth souls is wise. God wants us to work together as a team. We're in the Lord's army and not everybody holds a rifle. But we all work together in the army. In soul winning, evangelism, preaching the gospel, this is our main drive. And while we're there, we're going to find families to restore. And we're going to get the parents to bring their children to church. And we're going to teach the parents to teach their children the Bible, the priority of it. If they don't, they're going to have problems at home. When they do, they'll see spiritual success and they'll say, that works. I like it. We can give them that excitement. My goal is the Lord will let us rebuild, put life back in what may be a dead or dying church. And we're going to do it not with some new method. We're going to do it with the old ways, the old paths. Preaching the gospel, trusting in Jesus, staying independent, and building families. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love You so much. And Lord, I do ask that You would bless this ministry here. And Lord, we don't know what the future holds, but You do. And Lord, I just ask that if it's Your will, You would make it abundantly clear that You want us to work together and see souls saved and see families grow. Lord, we're depending on You. We can't do anything without You. And Lord, I'm begging You to let this happen. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.